my topic is um, a personal expression into my exploration into listening and its connection to empathy and how that's really come alive in my relationships here over the past few months since I've been at the foundation. Um, I use problems in relationships as an example um, of exploring how listening and empathy seem to change something within the relationships. And I also examine the possibility of uh, harmonizing or looking at the overlap between Christian Murphy's teachings on listening with empathic communication and how that's described by two psychologists who've used empathy to fundamentally alter the course of therapy and conflict resolution in relationships. And lastly, I wanted to share that this is, this is primarily a personal expression that I'm sharing, but it's also an invitation um, for all of you to look at yourselves and to see if perhaps something spoken here is shared connection within all of us. Um, my, my paper is called Listening is the Revolution, and I open with two quotes from Krishna. The act of listening is really a miracle. Perhaps it is the greatest miracle. When one can listen totally, without any defense, without any barrier, neither agreeing nor disagreeing. J. Krishnamurthy, The Real Revolution, Ohio, 1966. Listening is an art, but if you can listen totally to what is being said, then in that very listening, you will find there is a liberation. Because such listening is unpremeditated, uncalculated. It is an action of truth because your whole mind is there. Your total attention is being given. If you listen without interpreting, then you will find that your own mind has really got, undergone a really radical change. J. Krishnamurthy, fourth public talk in Madras from 1956. Perhaps life is much more simple than we think it is. The operative word there is think. Once I think, I have boarded an entirely different train. The train of thought, of control, of problem solving is running my life, whether in my job or in my home, in my friendship or in my family. I have to then solve every problem. In the context of relationships, I have to then solve all of the problems that arise in my relationships with each and every one. And that is the reality in which, I, in which I live, where I must solve everything. If I look at you as a problem I must solve, can I listen to you? Can I see you? Can I feel you? Can I be with you? So the first question then is, is there actually a problem in my relationship to you? Before I make this assumption, let us pause and look to see if it is even there. So, what if the next time I sense a problem appears to be present with you, I stop and I listen. Even if the problem is so real, so alive, so full of the powerful feelings of anger, hurt, sadness, or disappointment, which stem from a strong defensive reaction rooted in thinking that you are trying to hurt me, I instead just wait and I watch. At that moment, can I listen to myself fully? Can I listen, as Krishnamurti says, without interpreting? Can I hear my thoughts, feel my feelings, and be with my reactions if it has already been termed to be problematic? Can I listen to myself if I am condemning myself? If I am condemning myself, then I have also made myself into a problem. If I have already labeled what is happening a problem, then I have interpreted it. I have returned to the field of thought, and there is bound to be the search for a solution. Is there something always wrong with what is happening? Can I know that? If that is the lens through which I have been living my entire life, then living itself has become a problem for me to solve. I question if I must inevitably live this way. If I see that has been my life, I am compelled to ask the question, why? Perhaps I really just need to listen to myself. Maybe I need to feel I have heard myself, understood myself, and been with myself quietly, listening to my feelings, to my thoughts, to my reactions, perhaps alone, perhaps patiently, 
and spaciously. Similarly, let us look at how we listen to others <clears throat> when they approach us with their problematic relationships. If you are in a conflict with someone, and you come to me, and I stop what I'm doing to really listen to you, what happens? I look at you directly into your eyes. I stop fidgeting my fingers. I cease shuffling my feet. I see your expression, I hear your words, I catch the tone of your voice, I watch the tears stream down your face. I do not say that you are right or you are wrong. I do not interrupt you. But when I am fully alert to what you share, then maybe, just maybe, something else happens. If I listen to you fully, without trying to, without thinking about it, or without even thinking to not think about it, but allow myself to listen to you, then is the problem still there? When I stop trying to solve your so-called problem, or give you advice, or correct you, or reassure you, or agree or disagree with you, then something can happen. It seems then there is at least space, the space to listen. Yet there is no space when I'm trying to prove the point. If I'm proving that I'm right and you are wrong, and invest my whole being in that point, then how can I listen to you? Listening is not debating. So then, isn't listening taking place when I'm completely giving all of my senses and everything I have to you? When I listen to another with all that is in me, there is something powerfully communicated that silently speaks just through this deep listening. Krishnamurti once quoted, questioned a Buddhist monk and scholar, Dr. Walpola Rahula, in his third discussion, at Rockwood Park at a dialogue in June of 1978 by asking him, not once, but twice, when you and I are on the same level, with the same intensity, at the same time, what is that thing? Then words are not necessary. He then further probes Dr. Rahula by asking him, wouldn't you call that love? I am touched. I wonder what that thing is. That thing that cannot actually be spoken through a word that connects me with you. Krishnamurti is not referring to words, but he does refer to a meeting, and perhaps it comes through listening. Culturally, we have defined speaking as just through words, through speech, through sound. But that is not solely what communication is. We are not in communion because of those things. The act of being together with one another is not because of the word, the speech, or the sound. We often ask each other to listen, to give us attention, and it seems that there is something crucial in listening and attention. So I invite you to listen and to directly experience what I am saying now with your eyes, with your ears, with your heart, with your mind, with your whole body, with your nerves, and with the feeling deep within you. Will you? Or, Will you counter what I am saying with what you are thinking? Will you pounce on me to dismantle the words I have used to write this piece? Will you hear me with the thoughts that you have created about me or are creating about me right now? Are you listening or saying that you are listening? Listening is spoken quietly. At the core of deep listening lies empathy. Although empathy is not a part of Krishnamurti's vocabulary in his public talks, it is a word that we use, and a way of being we seem to align ourselves with, and therefore it is relevant and worth exploring when we consider listening to the so-called problems in our daily lives. We use the word empathy within the contemporary arena of healing and therapy as well. Empathy functions as a means to feel heard, to feel understood, and to feel connected. In that resonance with one another, we feel our wounds are healed. American clinical psychologists, such as Dr. Carl Rogers and Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, who have pioneered the movement of conflict resolution in relationships through empathic communication in contexts that range from war zones to family households, have defined empathy in essentially the same way that Krishnamurti defines listening. When Krishnamurti de describes listening, as being totally attentive to what is being said, without any defense nor any barrier of agreement or disagreement to hamper the process of listening where change transpires 
Dr. Carl Rogers speaks of the impact of empathy when he says, quote, when someone really hears you without passing judgment on you, without trying to take responsibility for you, without trying to mold you, it feels damn good. When I have been listened to and when I have been heard, I am able to reperceive my world in a new way and go on. It is astonishing how elements that seem insoluble become soluble when someone listens. How confusions that seem irremediable turn into relatively clear flowing streams when one is heard." End quote. So then, is listening empathy? I turn to what has happened for me. When I look at what occurs when I feel a friend of mine has truly heard me, has not passed judgment on me, has not taken responsibility for, our, for how I feel, and has not told me to become something other than what I am, and has not told me that I am wrong for what is happening, I can honestly say I am aligned with Dr. Rogers, and yes, it does indeed feel damn good. <laughs> when, when I am with another who actually listens, who stops whatever he is doing, who is looking into my eyes, sensing the emotional expression on my face, and is being there completely with me, without interruption, it is in fact transformative, because something does transform. That which was fully sensed in reality to be a conflict, a problem, an irreconcilable movement, dissolves in the space which fully allowed it, and I can move freely and from that in my day. I am no longer stuck because that movement which was calling what was happening as being stuck has lost its grip on me. I'm not saying that there is a magical tool of listening to apply to every moment, but rather can we pause when what we think of as a problem arises and look at it as a listener instead of as a thinker. To further explore how empathy overlaps with listening, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg explains what it is and what it is not by saying, instead of offering empathy, we often have a strong urge to give advice or reassurance and to explain our own position or feeling. Empathy, however, calls upon us to empty our mind and listen to others with our whole being. He elaborates on how empathy is needed not only for others, but also for oneself. When he writes, it may be necessary to provide ourselves with some emergency first aid empathy by listening to what's going on in ourselves with the same quality of presence and attention that we offer to others. Thus, just as we give presence and attention to others without advising or reassuring or explaining ourselves, we can also give such presence and attention to ourselves without advising or reassuring or explaining ourselves to ourselves. The next time I'm feeling sad, can I attend to this feeling with my whole being without advising myself on what to do about the sad feeling or reassure myself that everything will be fine even though I'm feeling sad right now or give myself explanations for why this sadness has arisen. What then is my relationship to this feeling if I actually listen this way? This line of questioning that Dr. Rosenberg uses to illustrate self-empathy parallels Krishnamurti's process of inquiry into listening because, because it is the same movement that Krishnamurti speaks of when he invites us to listen to ourselves without any interpretation, without any reference to analysis of either agreeing or disagreeing with what is, and, and without the use of knowledge to provide explanations for what is happening. Furthermore, both speakers allude to the essence of what is contacted through empathy or listening as total attention or emptiness that sparks that space, that quality which connotes a deep-rooted connection, a fundamental depth of understanding, and a place of human bonding. It seems that both Krishnamurti and Dr. Rosenberg are suggesting that an empty mind or a vacancy in the human being allows for such listening to flower. If we examine this more carefully, then we can see for ourselves that what they both are referring to need not be so difficult to see. I can look at my own life and see if I listen by asking myself if I can listen to you when my mind is full. If my mind is full of ideas of what I will do once you finish speaking 
full of hearing my reactive thoughts to what you are saying, or full of formulating my response to what you are saying while you are talking, then I can directly see, when my mind is full of all of that, then I have no space left for you. Therefore, I am really not listening to you at all. So, if I can clearly see when I am not listening, and that I need space to listen, then perhaps what Krishnamurti calls a miracle may not necessarily be so far away from me and you. This introduces the possibility that listening or empathy may be simple. What does it mean to simply listen? Babies listen simply. Their simplicity amazes me. Their senses are fresh and fully alert to what is happening. They do not have minds full of ideas. They look at you with clear and vital eyes. They grab toys. They cry loudly. They smile with their whole being. They pull your hair tightly with their fingers. They eat when they're hungry. They sleep when they are tired. They see, they taste, they touch. They hear and they feel fully with their whole being. Must they speak to communicate with you? To be in communion with you? To listen to you? To give their total presence to you? To empathize with you? Or are they already there with you? Being, feeling, sensing, living, listening. They are listening, but are you? Lastly, if listening, which is perhaps the greatest miracle that seems so rare, is actually something quite simple and not so distant, then perhaps we are on the brink of discovering it right now if we actually dare to listen. Thanks for listening. <laughs>